You're listening to Consulting Logistics, presented by Aborn and Company. I'm Tim Dooner. Welcome back, or thanks for joining us for the first time. Today, we've got a whole host of hot articles to cover, as well as some news. We'll be looking at the blockchain war. What is a supply chain benchmark? And news that covers the G7 Summit, the new ILA agreement, big sales for big rigs, and Home Depot's billion-dollar supply chain bet. Speaking of blockchain, I am just about to take off for IBM's B2B MFT Integration Innovation Day in New York. That's going to be all talk about blockchain, their partnership with Maersk. I'm very excited about it because what we've been hearing lately is all about blockchain. Recently, an article caught my attention. And what I found interesting was what was said by a few different carriers at the Global Liner Shipping Conference in Hamburg. Because it seems to me, folks, we might be on the cusp of the battle for blockchain. The blockchain war. Let's dive right into our article. And all of these can be found at abornenco.com slash blog. The battle for blockchain. The blockchain war. Attend any global trade conference this year, and one thing is abundantly clear. 2018 is the year of blockchain. Even as capacity issues plague the industry and trucking rates soar, blockchain is the Bitcoin-based buzzword on the tip of everyone's tongue. According to Techgistics, the global logistics market is predicted to reach U.S. $15.5 trillion by 2023. While global trade has run the world for centuries, the processes behind it are still stuck in the last millennium, a fact that isn't lost on some of the industry's oldest carriers, as well as a slew of startups, all aiming to be the world leader in supply chain digitization. The benefits and platitudes concerning blockchain have been sung far and wide. Thus far, we've been promised billions in savings, greater supply chain transparency, enhanced cybersecurity, error reduction, and scalability. Now, these are all fantastic and welcome innovations for an industry ripe for disruption. But with goals this lofty, one has to have standards. Right now, the biggest problem blockchain faces is that while many companies are developing supply chain-based blockchain solutions, few are collaborating with one another to standardize their solution. First, we have the old guard, the carriers. Digital disruption and emerging technologies in logistics are converging on a battlefield littered with archaic thinking, feuding carriers, and the scars of corporate culture clashes. Nowhere was this more evident than at the annual Global Liner Shipping Conference in Hamburg. It was there that Hatbag Lloyd CEO Rolf Haben Jansen had this to say. Technically, the solution by Maersk and IBM could be a good platform, but it will require a governance that makes it an industry platform and not just a platform for Maersk and IBM. And this is a weakness we're seeing in many of these initiatives, as each individual project claims to offer an industry platform that they themselves control. This is self-contradictory. Without a joint solution, we're going to waste a lot of money, and that would benefit no one. End quote. The Maersk and IBM blockchain solution is a joint venture, which will be its own company, that Maersk owns a 51% share in. The aim of the project is to create a global standard for blockchain that can be used across the shipping and supply chain ecosystem. IBM's head of global trade digitization, Norbert Kuenhoven, told Shipping Watch last year that there are 27 billion euros of savings to gain between the supply chain partners just from efficient sharing of information, end quote. Savings to gain equals profits to be had. And in a tight carrier market, other steamship lines aren't ready to drop anchor on the idea of a Maersk-controlled digital freight ecosystem. In fact, CMA, CGM, General Manager, Peter Wolf echoed Hatbag Lloyd's stance regarding IBM Merce blockchain program. 
Not because Halfback Lloyd and CMACGM were presenting their own solution. Instead, they believe that there are too many similar blockchain solutions on the market. Accenture and Kuna Nagel are developing their own blockchain application that, according to their press release, could reduce data entry by 80% and save the ocean shipping industry hundreds of millions of dollars annually. Perhaps Hapag Lloyd and CMA CGM do have a point. With multiple steamship lines creating solutions independent of one another, there are sure to be interests, both logical and competitive, that contradict the purpose of the universal standard that blockchain is supposed to provide. A new challenger appears. If there's money to be had and disruptive technology to be developed, it's usually not the stalwarts of old industry that stand to benefit. In fact, should an industry that has been content for this long using outdated technology be the stewards of our digital future? Napster, Netflix, Amazon, Uber, Airbnb, and Bitcoin. All tech that wasn't born in the boardrooms of Capitol Records, ABC, Walmart, or the Hampton Inn, but instead came from the dire need to innovate in order to meet market demands, oftentimes creating markets consumers had no idea they needed and now cannot live without. The same ideas, fresh outlook, and most importantly, venture capital that helped make these companies the industry leaders that they are today is now giving birth to a new breed of startups. Companies not concerned with quarrels over industry standards so much as creating solutions that meet market demands. Instead of worrying about what carrier is doing what, many blockchain startups are asking what technologies most benefit the solutions that they are developing, such as using the IoT or the Internet of Things to authenticate the ledger, enhance security, and supplement their blockchain solution. As Medium recently reported, IoT solutions based on the blockchain simplify business processes within supply chains and improve consumer experience by providing better security and reducing expenses. Simplify business processes, improve consumer experience, provide better security, reduce expenses. That's a pretty good recipe. Earlier this year, Techistics named their four innovative blockchain startups to watch in 2018. Neither of the four companies, Shipchain, Fresh Turf, Origin Trail, nor Cargo X, aim to set a standard for the other. Instead, they recognize that supply chains are inherently diverse and unique as are shippers' needs and demands. So what's next? The fact that the shipping industry is starting to embrace technology shouldn't be lost in the debate over whose blockchain is best. The fact that we're even having these discussions online and at conferences is a tremendous sign of progress. Whether it's Maersk IBM with the blockchain solution developed from inside the industry or a nimble startup outsider, one thing is for certain. If blockchain can simplify business processes within supply chains and improve consumer experience by providing better security and reducing expenses, then that's something we're all going to be using sooner or later, regardless of who develops it. You know, I get the feeling, too, it's going to be one of those technologies, almost like the cloud. It's, it's a buzz term, but it's one of those things that everybody sort of uses without necessarily thinking that they're tethered to the cloud. It just immediately becomes a part of business processes. That's where blockchain is going to be down the road. And you talk about the carriers. It's happened in every other industry. A startup comes in, Silicon Valley comes in, and they come up with a solution that makes the most sense to the people who use it instead of trying to make a solution that makes the most sense for the businesses who've been at the top of the industry for eons. Carriers. Now that's something that we benchmark. A typical answer I receive when I ask a prospective client if they've done a supply chain benchmark is, what is a supply chain benchmark? That answer is simple. A supply chain benchmark is no different than any other type of benchmark. It's a comparison between two or more things where performance is measured. For example, if you're shopping for a new smartphone and want one with the fastest processor available and better than average battery life, then you need to know what the fastest processor is and what average battery life is for the other smartphones on the market, right? So you want to know the Samsung Galaxy is as good as the iPhone X, right? Which one are you going to get? Actually, I think the iPhone did win in those benchmarks. 
I'm not taking sides here. So let's apply this to supply chains, though. If you're shopping for a new freight carrier, you may want to know who offers the fastest service and the lowest rates. I mean, of course, right? You want to know who's the best out there that's going to save you the most money. Unfortunately, unlike phones, supply chains all run on completely different operating systems. So in order to properly benchmark other carriers, a shipper first needs to benchmark their own supply chain. Want to guess what the second most popular answer I receive is when I ask a prospective client if they've done a supply chain benchmark? No. Here's why they should. Well, here's at least the objective of it. When you benchmark your supply chain, you're trying to determine two key things. How good is the service you currently receive? And two, how good does it have to be to differentiate yourself from your competitors? Cost and speed are the two most obvious areas where a benchmark can immediately provide clarity. But there's also a host of other issues they can correct as well. Shippers afraid that they don't have the correct processes in place know that a broken system can lead to audit errors, overpays, non-pays, and delays. Potential gaps in communication between IT, operations, finance, and warehousing creates exposure to all levels of risk within the supply chain. The objective of your supply chain benchmark is to help your company do a few things here. Understand their relative cost position. Benchmarking reveals a company's relative cost position and identifies opportunities for improvement. Improve performance. Benchmarking identifies and measures methods of improving operational efficiencies and improves best practices to gain strategic advantage. Benchmarking helps companies focus on capabilities that are critical to building a strategic advantage. Increase the rate of organizational learning. Benchmarking brings new ideas into the company and facilitates experience sharing. When you start hearing words like audit and benchmark, some shippers scurry away from the spotlight. It sounds like work, you know? The fear is that they're about to be looked at under a microscope in an invasive process. Well, fortunately, while benchmarks do shine a light on processes, they don't have to be disruptive. In fact, they can be tailored specifically to your requirements and what you need to measure. There's no law that a shipper has to KPI or benchmark themselves against any one particular data set or organization. Shippers can and should isolate areas and goals that mean the most to their supply chain. The questions we should be asking are about best practices. If best practices are the component that all results are derived from, modeled after, and improved towards, then the end result is a best-in-class supply chain that incurs lower costs than your less capable peers. Aborn and Company, we look at five key core components of your supply chain. One, carrier selection. Two, load planning. Three, monitoring and reporting. Four, freight audit and payment. And five, technical capabilities and processes. Why now? As trucking rates hit all-time highs and intermodal rates follow, Shippers need to seek new avenues for cost saving and efficiency in order to gain a competitive edge. According to a report by APQC, 76% of respondents to their survey feel that benchmarking is ingrained in their business methods. However, 29% say their organizations don't measure the financial impact. Another 33% of respondents did not know the financial impact of benchmarking. Well, 59% claim the findings were not made available across all departments. In order to fully benefit from benchmarking, companies need to follow best practices and understand the cost potential of their supply chain. Actionable purposes that drive internal growth, encourage best practices, and improve efficiencies should be considered as part of the value of a benchmark as should cost reduction. The 71% of companies who do measure the financial impact of benchmarks already experience that competitive advantage. Now my question to you is, when's the last time you benchmarked your supply chain? For bonus points, when's the last time your nearest competitor benchmarked their supply chain? I expect all answers in my inbox, tduner at 
abornandco.com. That's T D O O N E R at Aborn and C-O dot com. In a tight freight market, one where you can't control the cost of freight as it escalates, one thing you can do is take the reins of your supply chain and find the savings from within. Now, I don't call myself a freight guru, but there's very little chance that your supply chain is operating at 100% efficiency. Let's get into some news. Big weekend with the G7 Summit, but an even bigger one for us here on the East Coast because, whew, I was sweating this one. U.S. East Coast dock workers reach tentative agreement on new six-year master contract. The agreement announced by the International Longshoremen's Association, the ILA, still needs to be ratified by the U.S. Maritime Alliance, the USMX, and its members. Just last December, it appeared as if a contract may be a long ways off, as the ILA was battling hard against port automation. In fact, in a letter to members last year, ILA President Harold Daggett wrote, The ILA will not allow automation to rip apart our livelihoods and destroy our jobs and family. The ILA intends to let management know that we are totally opposed to fully automated terminals. End quote. However, with a West Coast ports contract in place, the ILA had little choice but to come to terms on a new master contract. And good thing they did. That really would have been a disaster. I don't know if you guys remember the West Coast port crisis, but that was, jeez, that wasn't even a full-on strike. That was a chassis issue. We shut down New York. I don't know. Cargo's up, too. G-Captain reports figures from logistics trends and insights that suggested a mixed start to the year. New York and New Jersey are seeing volumes up 7.3% in the first four months, while Savannah's volumes increased 6.5%. Unfortunately, the port of Virginia's Norfolk International Terminal saw figures remain flat year over year over the same period, while Charleston recorded a drop of 1.4%. Sales of big rigs doubled in May as carriers desperately try to meet demand of a freight market that is well over capacity. Just go back and listen to last episode to hear all about that one. With freight up 9.5% year over year and rates not far behind. I believe in that report is 9.1%. An influx of trucks couldn't have come at a better time. The purchase of 35,600 trucks is a 110% increase over May of last year. While truck manufacturers are racing to build more vehicles, the industry has an order backlog 208,000 trucks deep. Wow, so the average wait time right now for a new truck is over eight months. Roger Nielsen, chief executive of Dalmer Trucks North America, told Trucks.com, quote, You are seeing the backlogs grow to the point where you can say we're sold out for 2018. Wow. He's folding up his tent and going home. When the trucks do arrive, the industry has another challenge. Who's going to drive them? Again, listen to our last episode. A series of new tolls in Rhode Island has the Rhode Island Trucking Association laying on its horn. And there you go. $3.50. Never been in a state where it was trucks only just going to be harmful in so many ways to Rhode Island, and we shouldn't be doing it. So we're against tolls to begin with. But secondly, you obviously are now taking one class of tractor trailer, one class of truck, to shoulder the burden of Rhode Island's infrastructure. It's not fair. Everyone else in passenger vehicles has been subsidizing the trucking industry in Rhode Island. So we're tolling from a fairness standpoint the vehicles that cause the most damage and have not been paying their proportionate share of that damage in the past. Governor Raimondo's campaign shot back at Patricia Morgan, accusing her of wanting to bring the state back to having the worst bridges in America. Are you sure you want to go under them? I have no choice now. (laughs) The Rhode Island Department of Transportation activated two brand new tolls on Monday that could generate $45 million a year according to DOT estimates. The tolls come after a three-year-long battle that had truckers deriding the tolls as unfair and unlawful. Rita President Chris Maxwell said at a combined rally campaign event with House Minority Leader and anti-toll candidate for governor, Patricia Morgan, quote, This is not a one-front war where we are just going to sue. 
There could be many tactics through which this could be handled. It could be legislatively, and it could be administratively. It goes on to say, but every day it does not happen means there could be another strategy going forward. We don't know at this point. Okay, well, based on that, I would say it appears the tolls are here to stay for now. I don't know, Rita President Chris Maxwell, but he just used a lot of words to really not say mu- not say much of anything there in that quote. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. I like to avoid the tolls, too, so I don't blame him. Counter tariffs to be placed on U.S. aluminum and steel exports after contentious G7 summit in Canada. The move comes after President Trump's abrupt decision to withdraw support from the Group of Seven communique. German Chancellor Angela Merkel appeared on ARD television and had this to say. The withdrawal, so to speak, via tweet, is of course sobering and a bit depressing. After failing to get President Trump to budge on tariffs, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau held a press conference where he vowed retaliatory action. He says, Canadians are polite and reasonable, but we will also not be pushed around. It would be with regret, but it would be with absolute clarity and firmness that we move forward with retaliatory measures on July 1st, applying equivalent tariffs to the ones that the Americans have unjustly applied to us. Well, President Trump, who is on his way to meet with Kim Jong-un, didn't care for Trudeau's response, and he took to Twitter. President Trump tweeted the following, PM Justin Trudeau of Canada acted so meek and mild during our G7 meetings, only to give a news conference after I left, saying that U.S. tariffs were kind of insulting and he will not be pushed around. Very dishonest and weak. Our tariffs are in response to his of 270% on dairy. Moving on. The global automotive industry is coming under increasing pressure from rising incidents of supply chain disruption, according to a new report in Just Auto. The report, compiled by global insurance broker JLT Specialty, shows a significant increase in automotive supply chain disruption last year. Fires, hurricanes, labor strikes, and other disruptive events were up 30% in 2017 from the year before, while factory fires and explosions caused the most disruptive events. Mergers and acquisitions came in at a close second, with hurricanes and typhoons rounding out the top three. Wow. Mergers and acquisitions wasn't in the top five, and it's, it's now it's right up there with explosions and typhoons. You like Huey Lewis in the news? I guess that could be, though, right? You pick up a company, you have to switch supply chains around. That could slow things up, right? Matthew Grimwade, head of automotive at GLT Specialty, told Just Auto, Our research shows that automotive manufacturers face some serious challenges, not just in terms of the growing number of disruptive incidents in the supply chain industry, but in the diversity of these events too. Being able to gain an insight into the key areas of exposure and supplier vulnerabilities is essential if auto manufacturers are to effectively prioritize risk, prepare a plan, and protect their business. Manufacturers might also look to use this valuable insight to provide them with an opportunity to create a competitive edge. It's a big challenge, but certainly not an impossible one. End quote. And our last bit here, Home Depot. Home Depot to invest $1.2 billion into supply chain over the next five years. The retailer plans to add 170 distribution centers in the U.S. to expedite their online delivery process. The new distribution centers join 2,280 brick-and-mortar locations as Home Depot adapts to online sales and a changing retail landscape. Mark Holyfield the company's executive vice president of supply chain and product development told the Wall Street Journal, quote, This is part of an $11 billion overhaul plan to re-engineer our company to ensure that we are prepared for the future in retail, end quote. While online sales only account for 6.7% of the company's revenue, those sales are up 21% from the year before. And it also turns out that 40% of online purchases are picked up in stores. So they're looking for blockers and other ways to automate those as well. The company, in addition, is exploring the use of cars and vans in order to lower delivery costs on smaller items. Now, they're not the only ones either. I I saw someone delivering things for Amazon to my house in a late model RAV4. I don't know. That's probably not an official truck. I don't know if they're like, they're doing their own Uber delivery version, like, like Uber Eats, but they're bringing me my packages. Big things out of Home Depot. Love seeing investment in supply chain. Today we covered... The blockchain war, what's going on with that? We looked into what a benchmark is. We covered the news. 
I'm off to that conference. I will bring back uh, any great information I can from that one and cover it on here. You can go directly to our podcast host. That is abornandcompany.podbean.com. Visit our website, abornandco.com slash blog. You can reach out to me, tduner at abornandco.com. That's T-D-O-O-N-E-R. We're on Twitter, at abornandcompany, and on Instagram as well. This is Tim Dooner for Consulting Logistics, presented by Aborn and Company, saying take care and happy shipping.